Okay, we're back. Uh, I'm holding a microphone. Do I look like a news anchor? If I do, mission accomplished. So this video is gonna be a little bit different. If you've been following the YouTube channel, uh, yesterday or the day before, I posted a community post where I asked for some questions for Q&A, uh, along with a very shameless selfie of myself to try to grab your attention. And I'm just gonna answer them in this video. And before I get there, this is something I typically do on my podcast, the Chase the Summit Trail Talk podcast. I would encourage you, if you enjoy this kind of format, to go over and check out the podcast channel, which is linked on my main channel or on my website, or it's even an audio only version called Chase the Summit Trail Talk. Follow me there because that's where I do a lot of these ramblings, but I thought I'd just bring the ramblings to the masses today. There it is. There's the community post on YouTube that you all responded to. And thank you for everybody who sent in questions. It does make making these videos a lot easier when I have things to actually read. Okay, so we're gonna start the top and I'm just gonna read through these. This is totally unscripted. I haven't really pre-read these or thought about what I'm going to say. So we're just gonna be doing this on the fly. Hopefully that makes sense and it's entertaining. The first question is, what is your philosophy in regards to listening to something while you run? This could be a podcast, music, audiobooks, etc. Et uh, I'm of the mind that you should do what you want to do. I know there's a lot of purists out there that think wearing headphones in nature is bad. I'm not one of those. I listen to music almost 99% of the time maybe even more when I'm running. If I'm racing though, like if I'm in an ultra marathon or a shorter race, I typically don't listen to anything. And that's mainly because I wanna hear people around me and know what's what's happening in my environment. But this is you know, particularly the case at shorter distances. Sometimes in like 100 milers, I'll put in earbuds to pass the time. But for the most part, I listen to music and podcasts all the time. Next question is from Amir Castilla. Do you think AI driven metrics will be the biggest trend in smartwatches in this coming year. Hope you are doing well emotionally and phys physically. Uh, finish the year, kudos from Belize, big fan. Thank you, that's very nice of you. AI, AI is a huge topic that I probably deserves its own video. It seems like AI is used everywhere now as a buzzword, a buzzword in marketing. And it's hard to say what today is AI and what's just marketing because it seems like every company out there is like, AI, we've got AI now when a lot of the stuff isn't really AI. So I think moving into 2024, yes, AI is going to be a huge conversation in that year. I'm sure it will play a role in smartwatches and health devices. We're, 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 it's, it's just at the beginning of this whole AI thing. And as we've seen in 2023, it moves incredibly fast. I mean, it was only ChatGPT is less than a year old, I think, right? Or maybe just a year old. And it's come so far already and we've got versions of it from Google and Microsoft and it's crazy. I, I'm terrified of AI, you know, as somebody who makes content for a living that I could be replaced by AI. And I've actually replaced myself using some chatbot sims. I'll, I'll insert that here because it's kind of scary. I didn't even post it on my YouTube channel. I posted on my personal Facebook just so people could see how creepy it is. But I might even try to use it on YouTube, we'll see. Okay, next question is from Andy Hersky, 3878. Always enjoy your reviews. It has helped me make some really good purchases. Was wondering if you know of the Minotaur Sky Race in Crown Nest Pass, Canada. I, I trail run and jog this area and think you would really enjoy the race. I've never heard of that race. It sounds pretty badass though. The Minotaur, isn't that like a, like a mythical creature or something? I'll have to look it up. Thanks for the recommendation. Next question is from Emil Rux. Do you hike with your kids? Do any of them run already? Is there a conflict between wanting to train for your goals versus wanting to introduce them to the sport? This is a really loaded question. So I am a dad to four children. I have a two-year-old, five-year-old, seven-year-old, and 11-year-old. So we, we've got ages throughout the entire spectrum for kids. And that makes things really challenging. I like I like to think that I'm an active dad, but the goal, you know, for me in my mind, this dream world of being a dad would be me pushing like a stroller with four kids and being totally cool with that and just like running a six minute pace. That isn't what I can do. In fact, having that huge age swing makes you know going for a run with my kids really hard because the two year old and five year old they can't they can't move very fast and they can't move for very long. They get tired very quickly. So they're a tough age, especially the five-year-old because 
He's too big for a stroller at this point, and he can't run a mile nonstop. But what's cool to see is my older kid, the 11-year-old, has actually been getting into running, and he's all, he's completed two 5Ks this year. He's really stoked on it, and that's very exciting for me. So I do think introducing them to the sport is going to come later in life. Next up, we've got a set of questions. Thank you, uh, Peter, P- Peter O.D. I think I pronounced that right, Peter. So the first part of his question is, a training plan for 50K question mark. I'm not going to recommend a training plan because I'm not a coach or, you know, a professional in the sport. In fact, I'm pretty bad at running 50Ks myself. My my fastest time for PR for 50K was five hours and one minute. And that was in 2018 or 2019 when I was like in way better shape than I am right now. Uh, the way I approach them is I run a lot of the terrain that I expect in the race. So if I'm doing a hilly race, I try to get in a lot of hills and I amp up my volume significantly. So I'm tra- if I'm training for a 50K, I'm probably running 30 to 40 miles a week, maybe more depending on my goals. But that's really all I'll share with you on that because I'm not a coach. The opinion on minimalist barefoot shoes. So I have mixed feelings on them. I know a lot of people who really like them. And I've seen people running really hard races, like really rugged, rocky, like sharp surfaces in these like super thin shoes. And they seem happy. Personally, myself, I I like a nice thick stack height on my shoe. So I'm running in Hoka's or Ultras. You can see some of the background there with like a 30 millimeter stack height to protect my feet. And that's just my personal preference, but it's kind of all over the place. Uh, For me, they're, you know, the minimalist shoes, I like them for like around town, around the house kind of thing, but I'm not going to run a trail race in them. Next question, music genres you are into or playlists on Spotify? Okay. Uh, my music is not for everybody. The stuff I listen to is like remnants of my high school past where I used to have, I don't know if you've noticed in videos, but I've got these holes in my ears because I had like gauged ears with like these big pegs in my ears. I had a lip ring. I had an eyebrow ring. Of course, I have tattoos and stuff. And I was really into like the hardcore kind of screamy music scene. So that's changed over the years. I've definitely evolved musically. Now I'm really into, I still listen to that stuff, but I, I also added in a lot of electronic music, a lot of like hybrid rock electronic music. Next up, we've got favorite shoes of 2023. This one's pretty subjective, but I think I'd probably give it to the Hoka Mach X. Those are shoes I've been wearing like every day. And if you go back and watch a video I posted about a month ago about my shoe rotation, they're included in that video where I talk a lot about them. And finally, from Peter OD, we have goal races for 2024. This one's tough because I'm still sort of planning out my year. I'm really bad at planning stuff, if you haven't noticed yet. So 2024, I've got basically two guaranteed things already in, you know, signed up for. One of them is a 50K on the West Coast in California in February, but I'm not going to share any details about that because I'm actually working. It might be through a brand or, you know, I'm basically being invited out there, but it's kind of a soft invite right now. So I don't know if that's going to happen or not. And I don't want to talk about it because of that. And the other guaranteed thing is the Vermont 100 endurance race. And that's in July. And that's not even guaranteed right now because I need a qualifier to run it. So if you don't know, last year in 2023, July, the Vermont 100 was canceled due to terrible flooding in the, the state of Vermont. And they've deferred everybody to the next year. But just because they deferred you doesn't mean that you're automatically in. It just means you get to bypass the lottery. So I'm definitely in as long as I can qualify. And to qualify, I have to run a 50 mile race in under 12 hours, which isn't that hard for me. I can definitely do that. However, it's got to be a pretty easy course for me to do that because there's one race in May. I I typically race every year called the Wapak and back. I actually DNF'd at it last year and it's a 50 mile race, but it's really, it's a really hard course. So it's hard to get under 12 hours on that course. So it's not a great qualifier. So I might have to find a different race in order to qualify. Next question from Oleg Cole is what should I consider and focus on when training for my first 50 K trail race? coming from road races in half in trail half marathons. So again, I'm not a coach, but I guess I'd say the two important things in my mind are volume, getting that volume up. There's actually three important things. So if you're coming from a road running background, I'd say volume one, increase your mileage, two, decrease your effort. So don't go 
at an all-out pace, try to fall into like a zone two. And then uh, third, try to tr try to train on the type of terrain you'd be racing on. So if you're going to run, you know, a really hard up and down, super hilly kind of course, make sure you're doing that in training as well. And you don't just show up on race day and get your butt kicked because you're not used to that kind of terrain. That's about all I'll share on that. Next question is from Melissa on the move. Uh, I know you did a Prezi Traverse this year. What are your tips for someone who'd like to do this in the future. Okay, so the Prezi Traverse, for those of you who don't know, is the Presidential Traverse. That's Prezi is for short. Everyone calls that calls it that around here. And that's a course or a trail or a set of trails in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And the Prezi Traverse is about 20 miles long. It's about 19 miles, but it's got a lot of vert. It's 9,000 feet of elevation gain. Can be more than that, depending on the route you take. And it's super rugged terrain, like boulders on top of boulders, lots of up and ups and downs and just like super gnarly terrain. So I guess if you're looking for tips on what, what you can do to sort of get into the condition to do that, I don't know where you're at now. If you're like a couch to press each reverse kind of person, or if you're already like hiking and trail running, I would say go up there and hike some of the peaks without doing the traverse. It will give you an idea for how difficult it is. I would say if you want to challenge yourself, try Mount Adams and uh, Jefferson first. There's a loop that goes up Mount Adams and Jeff Jefferson. Those are two of the toughest sections of the entire Prezi Traverse. Or, you know, try hiking Mount Washington, which is the tallest peak in the range, because that'll give you an idea for the terrain. In terms of doing it in a day, it's really not that bad. You could hike it out in a day. It could take, you know, 13, 14 hours to hike it out if you don't do any running. Next question from WP7 Network. As we know, Garmin releases watches every year, but I still ask you what you what you most expect from Polar next year, Sunto and LS Garmin. So Polar, it's interesting because they've slowed down their release cycle quite a bit. They just released the Polar Vantage V3. I didn't give it a great review because I didn't get great results from it, but I actually have a new one coming in the mail. Actually, it might be today. Uh, Polar sent a new one out with a new updated firmware that I'm gonna be retesting for another review, so stay tuned for that. Based on what I've seen in the past, they, they're probably gonna update their other watches with the Vantage V3 hardware, so they'll probably come out with a new Grid X Pro with the new heart rate sensor. Uh, but I guess time will tell. I don't know what their numbers look like, but I can't imagine they're selling a ton right now with all the competition. Maybe they'll just start doing like a single release every year. When it comes to Sunto, they released the vertical on the race this year. I bet they don't update either of those in 2024 just because the race is so new and I don't think their update cycle is going to be very quick. They In the past, they, they don't like release a new thing every year. What I do think they will do is come out with a a less expensive option with the new tech in it. So maybe like, like a new version of the Sunto 5 that they had with, you know, the new OLED screen and better battery life and stuff like that. That would be interesting. Maybe the multi-band GPS chipset. And then Garmin, they're going to do what they do every year. There's potential for a new Phoenix and Epics, I think. I don't know. The, the Phoenix and Epics Pros are so new that they probably won't do that either. It's kind of a mixed bag. I'm not sure what to expect from Garmin. The next question comes from DS Harrett 21 when you train, what's your main focus when it comes to the big three? That's pace, heart rate, and cadence. I personally use all three depending on the goal of the workout. So when it comes to me and training, I like to say I base most of my data off running power, but I don't really do that. I think I mainly focus on pace and heart rate. Pace and heart rate together gives me a good idea of, you know, how I'm adapting how I'm adapting to training. And I do use running power, but not as often as I probably should. And I also don't really do like structured workouts. Like I'm not the type of guy that goes to the track twice a week to do like speed work, even though I probably should. I'm really like just focused on volume and getting long zone two, zone three runs in. So that's kind of where I'm at. Next question from Co Constant. Do you have plans for more guests on the podcast? I don't mind listening to your rants, <laughs> but when you interview someone like Shervin Shares, it gets the podcast a little extra. Yes. So the big problem with me and, you know, for those of you who care about the podcast, this is for you, is I'm not great at interviewing people. In fact, I'm kind of introverted and inviting people into my space here or even chatting on Zoom is very intimidating to me. Like having Sher Shervin here was kind of intimidating. Super nice guy. We had a great day hanging out. But I'm just not the type of person that's like so outgoing I can talk to anybody, which is ironic for somebody on YouTube and that has a podcast. So while I do enjoy guests, I feel like I need to do so much prep work to get them 
I don't know, to know enough about them to be able to have a functional conversation that it's just too overwhelming for me and I don't do it. That said, I do have a, a long list of guests that I want to reach out to you and bring on. And I do have one in the near future, so stay tuned. There, I'm definitely going to up my game with the podcast. I know it's gotten a little stale. I enjoy doing it still, but I do need to change, mix things up a little bit. So thank you for the reminder. The next question from Alizi here is, what do you think is a piece of gear that's missing that needs to be made? And that is such a good question. Let me think about that for a second. Okay, I got one for you. A stroller for running, like a running stroller that doesn't weigh a million pounds and can be used on trails. Because I've had a lot of running strollers made from manufacturers like Thule and Bob and what's the other one, Phil and Ted. And all of them just suck, man. They all weigh a ton. They're hard to push. Like the Bob double stroller we have is probably 50 pounds. When you're trying to run behind that thing up a hill, it's like a joke. Like what, what are these developers doing over at these stroller manufacturers? Should I start doing stroller reviews on the channel? Next question is how would you break down your week in terms of mileage, kinds of sessions, recovery training for 50K to 100 miler, any given block with build, looking to make a transition from the 5K marathon, 47 mile peak speed sessions, etc. So I guess I'll repeat myself again. I'm not super structured in my training plans. If I'm training for a 100 miler, uh, my weeks will generally look like 50 to 70 miles per week. And that's at peak. I will not break. I don't think I've ever broken a hundred miles in a week, except for race week when I actually ran the hundred miler. Other than that, I'm pretty loose on training and I don't know. I just get, I try to go by like my gut, what, what I think my body needs on a given day. If it feels like I've got energy in the tanks, I go for my long run or harder effort. If I'm burnt out and tired, I take it pretty easy or I take a rest day. That's that's plain and simple for me. Tico fam outdoors. Hi, thankfully this has not happened to me, a stolen watch, but what with the price of Garmin watches and some sensitive personal information appearing on the device, there should be a way to block the watch if stolen. Have you heard of something that could be implemented to address that? That's a great question. I've thought about this myself, especially when I'm like running in sketchy areas of cities and stuff. Like I, I feel kind of nervous having, you know, three different thousand plus dollar watches on my wrist. And of course, you know, my thousand dollar cell phone in my pocket with phones and stuff. There's a usually a way to remotely wipe them, which is smart, but we don't have that on GP, GPS watches. If you think about Apple with the Apple watch ultra and the series nine, they've done that. You can wipe out your watch remotely if you lose it and you can locate it using Find My. I guess the harder part of this would be accessing the watch without it being near you because the watch needs an internet connection to be accessible from your Garmin Connect account. So if it's just laying in the woods somewhere with no Wi-Fi or Bluetooth connectivity, how would you remotely wipe it? That's the hurdle. So until they come out with an LTE watch, I don't think they'll be able to do that. Next question from Lewis Palmer. Best advice for picking up running after recovering from injuries? I'd say just, you know, ease into it. Again, I'm not a medical professional or a coach, but for me, I've been injured multiple times. I recently, you know, this year I broke my toe, which sucked. And uh, after that, it took a while to get back into the swing of things. It took like solid two months of taking it pretty easy before I could run again. And then when I started running again, I tried to abide by the 10% rule. The 10% rule is don't increase your mileage on a weekly basis more than 10%, which is tough if you're only running five miles or 10 miles, because that means that 10 miles per week, you can only increase by one mile. I've, I've heard people say that. I'd say a 20% rule is probably, you know, probably a more realistic way to look at it. Maybe try that. Benjamin Meridian, I think. Do you think we'll come out with an LTE watch in 2024? We need a Phoenix type LTE. So the Apple watches are already LTE. You can go buy one right now. But yeah, will Garmin do it? I don't know. It's it's such a weird path that they've been doing for the past years. Uh, they had the Garmin Foreigner 945 LTE, that was an LTE watch, but kind of LTE, because you could only do certain things with the LTE. They also had a Garmin Vivo Active LTE version of that. That was a total bust because it only worked on the Verizon network or AT&T, I forget. And just recently, last year, they came out with the Garmin Bounce, which is a, a children's watch with like way more functionality than any of their other watches with LTE like casual text messaging and things like that, but it's a kid's watch. 
So I've just been waiting for them to take that technology that they developed with the Garmin Bounce and adapt it to work with, you know, their grown up watches like the Phoenix and Epics and stuff. I think it will happen. It's a matter of time. I think the tough part for them is the infrastructure. Um, you know, they don't own their own cell phone towers and stuff. So they will have to try to find a way to leverage other carriers. And that's where things get pretty messy. So will it happen in 2024? I'm I'm unfortunately going to say no. Uh, will it happen in 2025? Maybe. That's my answer to that. Next question from Kai. What are your next goals? Uh, goals in what area of my life? If you're talking professionally, uh, I plan to continue to develop this YouTube channel. I've got like big ideas for this YouTube channel that I'm scared about, but excited about at the same time, because I want to take some risks on this YouTube channel and maybe bring in some help, you know, like other people to, to sort of help me out in certain aspects. I, I want to grow the podcast more. I'm really excited about the podcast and the potential there. And in terms of like fitness goals in 2024. So Rewind a little bit. 2023 hasn't been a great year for me fitness wise. I'm like in okay shape, but I want to be in like the best shape of my life. And I keep saying this, but 2024 is going to be the year for that because my youngest child, my daughter will be a little bit older. I think we'll have a little bit more flexibility and time here in my house and Hopefully that can open things up for me. Drew K9121, do you agree with others that the future of fitness watches is AMOLED? The unfortunate reality here is that the future of watches is AMOLED. And I hate to say it, but I do think that we're going to see the MIP transflective display start to disappear over time. I'm wondering, you know, brands like Koros, they're all MIP, but... For me, being on YouTube with these things, I've been seeing more and more comments and always on the Koros videos, they're like, still MIP, really? I think Koros is eventually gonna go AMOLED too. Now, MIP still has its place though. I still really like MIP and it's got a lot of advantages and a lot of people just like it better because it feels like a analog device. It's not like in your face, like a phone or screen time all day long where AMOLED kind of feels like you have a phone on your wrist. So I, I think MIP displays deserve to stick around. I just wonder if their market share is gonna dwindle so much to a point where companies just don't see the value in keeping them around. So that's my answer to that. Next question from KPN79. Who has chased the summit? And I'd like to watch the process of filming your videos, what it's like behind the scenes, your thoughts of further AI implementations in watches and services around this. Well, to answer the first part of your question, I'm Dave. <laughs> that's. That's Chase the Summit, I guess. But I actually branded the YouTube channel Chase the Summit after a lofty goal I had several years ago when I was kind of out of shape. I wanted to climb Mount Rainier, which is a big mountain out in Washington State here in the USA. And I never got to climb that mountain, but through the process of getting into shape and sort of documenting it, I kind of stuck with the branding to the channel. That's why it's called Chase the Summit. I also like the idea of the brand of being sort of an umbrella, not so much just about me because it would be cool to diversify a little bit further down the road. In terms of, you know, coming behind the scenes with me, you're kind of here right now, but it would be cool. Maybe I should do some sort of like day in the life kind of thing. Would you be interested in that? Let me know in the comments of this video down below. In the last part of your question, you ask about AI in implementations in watches. And I think I already answered that in someone else's question. AI is so scary, man. Next question from George Bezos. What are you competing for right now? And what is your current training program? Uh, I'm not really competing for anything. I don't think I ever have competed for anything. Actually, that's a lie. Several years ago, I thought I could get podium at a couple of races. Actually, one, one race, one, 150 mile ultra marathon. I came in first place male and I came in, I think fourth place as a 50K. But other than that, I'm not very competitive. When I race now, I really show up to try to prove something to myself and to just have a good time. You know, I really enjoy the trails. Next question from Jenenden. Jenenden, best way to start with trail running? Well, it's pretty simple. You gotta go put some shoes on, find a trail and run on it. That's the end of that question. Uh, Omarsa Saad, I want to get the epics, but I'm afraid of burn in. Any advice? What this person is referencing is screen burn in because on OLED displays like my iPhone here, uh, if the screen stays on the same image for too long, there's a risk of it getting stuck on that image. But to my knowledge, Garmin has addressed that 
with their displays. They use a certain kind of display that avoids burn-in, and they do some trickery in the software that actually moves the pixels ever so slightly that's imperceivable to the human eye in order to avoid burn-in. So I wouldn't be scared of it. In fact, if you Google it, you don't really see too many complaints about burn-in. So it seems like a non-issue to me. The next question is from Alex Johnson. I'm no marathon runner, nor do I want to be. I have started running with my son. I'm also like to, I also like to mountain bike and hike. I am looking to upgrade my Vivo Active 4 and want a durable multi-sport watch. What's your opinion on the best bang for your buck, buck Garmin watch right now with maps? The last part's tricky because uh, only the expensive one have maps. So like the 409, 965 or the 955 are the least expensive with maps and those are still, you know, 500 bucks. I think your best bang for the buck would probably be to buy an older watch. So if you buy a 945, you could probably get one super cheap and those do have maps. So that might be worth considering. The downside there is you're not going to get the latest hardware or you know, continuous firmware updates for in the near future because they'll probably stop developing for it after a couple of years. Next question from Deverett97. What do you say to people who don't believe in a runner's high? Asking for a friend. Hmm, so runner's high is sort of a mystery to me as well because I don't know if I get, if I ever feel that runner's high. I guess I do get that like dopamine hit after a long run when I'm training. But for the most part, it's always hard. And there's always points where I'm like, why am I doing this? What I would say to those people though, is to give it a shot. You know, don't knock something until you try it. And there's so many stigma things around running. Like people think it, uh, it could have like, it affects your body. You, ha you end up with like a runner's body or something, which I don't, I've never understood that one. Everyone thinks running is bad for your knees. Running is better than sitting on your couch. So I would just encourage other people to try it. Steve Bergman, 2712, build the best watch. What material, size, band, heart rate, GPS from, screen, etc. Uh, okay, this is fun. So if I could build the best watch, I would start with the Sunto Race body, chassis. No, I take that back because it's kind of big for my wrist. I would go with the Garmin Foreigner 965 chassis because it's light and, uh, you know, the form factor is nice. I like the form factor. I would give it the battery from the Garmin Enduro 2, which is impossible because the battery is way too big for a case that size, but this is just hypothetical. So I'd, I'd have the 965 case, the Enduro 2 battery. I would take the screen from the Epix Pro 51 millimeter. I would take the GPS chipset from the Sunto vertical and I would put a sapphire lens on it, give it metal buttons and a quick fit band. And I think that's it. Oh, and I put the Apple operating system on it, Apple Watch <laughs> operating system on it, but it would still have all the Garmin stuff like body battery and stress tracking, sleep tracking and all that stuff, just with the ability to take and make phone calls from a microphone built in, LTE built in and super smooth scrolling and interactions and gestures and stuff, but all with insane battery life from that Enduro 2 battery. That would be sweet. Okay, we've hit the final question from the Kids All Light. Uh, what's the most disappointing product you have used this year? Ooh, <laughs> that's a good question. That's a tough one. Disappointing is a strong word. So I guess I'd have to give it to the Polar Vantage V3. And it's kind of ironic because I recently released a video called the best and worst smartwatches of 2023, where I didn't award the V3 with my most disappointing release. I actually gave it to the Apple Watch Ultra 2 uh, for different reasons. But I, I guess the Vantage V3 was really disappointing for me because I was very excited about it. There's a lot of hype about it. I had a lot of faith in Polar to, to really nail the V3. And unfortunately in my testing, they didn't nail it, but I am hopeful for the V3. I don't think the story is over yet for that watch. I think with firmware updates and tweaking, they will make it better. And they're sending me a new one. So hopefully when I get that one and retest it, I can give you some good news. But for now, I am gonna give the disappointing disappointment to the Vantage V3. All right, friends, that's the end of the Q&A list from that community post. And uh, this was a fun one. Thank you so much for sending in all those comments and questions. Uh, I really appreciate it. Maybe I'll do this again if you guys enjoy it. In the comments of this video down below, also give me some ideas for future video videos coming down the road. What do you want to see on this channel? What what excites you? What's fun and interesting? I'd love to hear from you. Comment down below. 
And before I go, I don't know if I'll get a chance to, I just wanna thank you, the viewer, uh, for an awesome year. This has been super fun this year, being able to kind of live my dream, pursuing YouTube as a full-time career, and it's only possible because of the viewers of the channel and people who have, who have helped me out and supported me throughout the year. And I've got big plans, man. It's not over yet. In 2024, a lot is gonna be happening. I've got a lot of travel planned. I'm gonna be all over the place. In a few weeks, I'm gonna be in Vegas, which is wild. And uh, just stay tuned because there's a lot coming, a lot of racing, a lot of running, a lot of trails, a lot of travel all that stuff. So thanks again for sticking around. If you haven't yet, make sure to go down and hit the thumbs up and subscribe button. Really appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you next time. Bye.